welcome everyone. We have the honor of having with us today two of my favorite people anywhere, and they should be yours too, if you pay attention. Sandra Sims, retired judge, thought leader, and just an overall fine, fine person. And I have that on good authority from her entire family. <laughs> and, and Louise Ng, one of our leading character leaders in the bar in all respects. Hey, I don't think it's possible to think of things that this bar association and especially the women in the bar association have done that's been really legacy building stuff that Louise has not been right in the thick of and at the forefront of. So thank you folks for being here. <clears throat> My softball question to you digging deep, what from 2020 can we take and build on into 2021 that helps take us in a direction of hope and faith? Mm, I defer to the judge. <laughs> I was gonna defer to the, to the thought leader, but okay. <laughs> But you know, for me, it's there's some intense personal stuff involved with this as well. As most of you know, we began this year with you know with my husband very seriously ill and uh, undergoing uh, treatments for cancer, and this is before uh, the COVID kind of hit. And so we had gone through quite a bit up at the beginning of this year, and he passed away, and. It was just before the reality of the COVID was beginning to hit. I mean, we were able to do visits and things like that, but once the kind of COVID thing, all of a sudden visits were cut down. And in his last uh, hospital stay was without, was going to be without the benefit of having family and come and stay with him or doing those last times. And as, as difficult as that was, we were just getting ready for the worst of things to come. Uh, he left peaceably. And uh, once he was, <laughs> I'll just share a funny part about it, but once we had uh, actually arranged to have um, a hospice at home and we were gonna bring him home and have him put in, a, in, our, in the living room in a hospital set up, they were all thinking, and I, I was just kind of in a fog. I'm not sure how, but my kids were great about, we're going to do this and dad, you can come home and, you know, be at home. Well, if you know my husband and Chuck, you know, and uh, he's a, you know, kind of was an avid golfer, uh, you know, jazz guy and dog guy and all this other stuff. And I think the day that we actually told him we were going to bring him home and, and he was going to be in the, in the bed in the hospice at home. I think he kind of went like, oh, hell no. I'm not going home and sit in the living room and have you guys look at me uh, like I'm in some zoo. And he passed that night, literally. And I honestly believe that's, so we begin the year with that. And that's, that's been hard, it's been hard. And then we go into the COVID, but what? And then the elections and all of that. But in the midst of all of this just, oh, drama and craziness, there were always people who came forward for whatever reasons and all the timeliness, there were always, and not just sympathetic, but just people being incredibly generous and thoughtful and kind and, and there through that. And also when we started getting into the, you know, all of other people who were suffering from going through uh, what was happening in COVID, it was like the, the, the Mr. Rogers thing, <laughs> you know, the, the, the idea that you look for the helpers. And there were always helpers. In every situation that we went through this year, there were helpers. Somebody would come out of the, out of the woodwork somewhere with something kind, some thought, some, something. And that was very, very sustaining for me. Some, I've had some you know, really tough moments, yes. But even doing this and being around you folks was one of those moments of just like, oh, 
I'm okay. I think I can get through here and, you know, still be a responsible human being. And I don't have to crawl into a rug and roll myself, you know, down the hall. Uh, it was that. There were always these things that came along and people who just had those opportunities to, to, to connect with the real authentic, whatever that is in me. So when we get to these elections and it's just, whoa, we got involved in that. And here we are now with more people, the highest number of people dead in this country that we've ever seen. Um, we're moving into a new year, which can't come soon enough. And I still think there are the helpers. The helpers are still out there. There's, there's a couple of wonderful points. There's a whole bunch of them in there, but a couple that just kind of leap out and shine. Uh, one is that, in a sense, his last words were the same as the words of the American voters. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> but what, where that really yeah. comes from. <laughs> Like a oh hell no, <laughs> exactly. No, you you gotta know him to know that's that's, I know exactly, that's, that's exactly what he was thinking. It's like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, and this if, is not gonna happen. <laughs> and and from, from where he's sitting right now, you know he's looking down and saying, Well, at least you got something right. And we did. Yeah. And we're going into the next year with a president who knows better than any we've ever had what living with intimate tragedy in the family really is. That either builds you or breaks you. Yes. And Brian Schott said something about President elect Biden that really registered with me. And he said, Chuck, he's been there almost 40 years. Everybody knows him. You will never hear anyone say a bad word about Joe Biden personally. They may accuse him of this political leading, that political leading, this associate, whatever, but nothing personal. Because he is that well liked, respected, and regarded. And, and, and that leads to the other piece, I think, of what you share. And that is, in times of unexpected, unmanaged, uncontrolled, unimaginable trauma and crisis, people have stepped up. We have never ever seen the number of stories of people simply out of the blue doing things for others. The number of stories where somebody going through a drive-in fast food line is told by the cashier, your meal's been paid for. There's somebody at a restaurant, somebody at a supermarket. This stuff, and I think those two are connected. I think standing up for yourself, okay, and I think reaching out to others in need come from the same place. How does that connect for you, Louise? Well, that makes me feel better already, Chuck. <laughs> but... Um... I would say, you know, as you were talking, what, I, what made me think about was the fact that we've had a real, it's been a year of dissonance, probably four years of dissonance in the sense that at the national level, there's things that just drove us crazy on a daily basis, but there's good things happening in our lives and our community. And I would say that that was what was happening in this COVID year too. Um, you know, unprecedented things happening on the macro level in terms of the spread of the, uh, having the word pandemic becoming so widespread. And on the other hand, uh, and are having to do the unthinkable and work from home. And then all these people who are unemployed and businesses closing has just been sad, sad. Um, but then there have been silver linings. You know, we've spent, had to work from home, spent more time with family, um, had family come back from the mainland and spent time with them. I mean, this is the first year that I've been spending more holidays with fat, you know, kids that were living on the mainland for years. So that's that's been great. And people, as you say, helping each other. So on the community level, you know, our sort of person-to-person, business-to-business community level, there have been many bright spots. 
And uh, it was just that if you, we can just ignore what's happening on the national level, you know, there's hope. But now with the election, um, you know, maybe we'll have less dissonance and more happy, you know, feeling like there is faith and hope and joy, what's going on at the national level, as well as what we can do to pivot and revitalize and recover at the community level too. So, you know, every, uh, many years, my Christmas card, I always choose the card that has faith, love, joy, family, that kind of thing in it. And um, this year I'm feeling like, well, it's taken on new meaning, um, joy in the little things and, and faith that things will get better um, and hope as well that 2021 will be better. And at the same time, that there are things that we can appreciate from 2020. No, I think that really says it beautifully. Hey, and I think the point that connects what both of you have said is that the sense that we really are in this together, I mean, despite all the division, despite the hostility, despite the intensity of it, hey, we almost seem to be moving into a direction where those who are trying to maintain that level of divisiveness, hostility, vindictiveness, all of that anti-people, anti-connective stuff, they're kind of shrinking down into identifiable cult, cult groups, fringe groups. And people are uncomfortable with that. And I think that signals maybe a growing awareness that there really is a choice and the choice is meaningful and there is a difference and it makes a difference what choice we make. You know, is that gonna happen in Georgia? I don't know, we've got a lot of the old stuff up against the new stuff. And that's a good thing. It is. And that's a good thing. Um, that's a good thing. I think that's that's where that's you know where the real change is going to be coming from. It's the ones coming up. I know Louise and I have been involved in organizations because he with um you know with women attorneys and all that for a long time. And you're seeing this generation, this younger generation of 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 well, I'm just focusing on professional women uh, who are just simply awesome stepping up to the plate and taking everything to just a different level. Even in our little, I mean, I'm involved in a bunch of little organizations, a little bit good sized organizations. And again, seeing these younger, bright, intelligent, resourceful, uh, thinking outside the box women leaders is simply, uh, it, it just, it, it really, it really brings joy to my heart. I mean, it's, it's really hopeful because my goodness, I don't, I, I look at them and I mean, I, my own daughters, I look at them. It's like, I don't think I was that smart when I was that age. I, I don't think I could have come up with the kinds of things and ideas and, and things that they are, are, are doing. I, I, I didn't have that. I don't think I did, but but it's I I'm in an, I'm extremely encouraged by that, um, even in like the Georgia situation. Several of the members of my uh, links organization are heavily involved in Georgia politics. Uh, the mayor of um, the mayor of Atlanta, Stacey Abrams herself, is also a member of 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 links. And so this organization, I mean, while we're not a political organization, you know, it's heralding the support and the and the leadership of these incredible, incredibly bright women. It's just, I love it. You know, and that's a, I think that's a point that cannot possibly be over appraised as to its value. I, I think it's immeasurable. If you look at the leadership in that choice, the leadership of that choice has come from women, from Black Americans, from Indigenous Americans, from young people, from people who were not, not only not part of leadership, they were marginalized. They were underserved. Yeah. They yeah. were disrespected. And these are the people who have stood up and made 
this choice possible. And for a president to come in and designate his entire spokesperson team as all women, a truly diverse collection of women, hey, and for the vice president elect yeah. to get up and the first words out of her mouth are, I'm here for my daughter yeah. and all those for whom this may be possible. Yes. You cannot overvalue that. No. Can if I? that doesn't give you hope and faith, give it up. Yeah. I remember when Louise was involved in starting up the women's, you were involved in starting up the Hawaii Women Lawyers and Hawaii Women Leader a Legal Foundation. Again, I, can't take, I can't take credit for either of those, but you remember it starting. Yeah. I helped, I, I was early on. I was early on, but I was just a helper. I mean, we were all just, because it wasn't but a few of us, there was no reason to, to say no, because there was only a handful of women yeah. to anyway so but i mean if you maybe even that looking at the legal foundation where it's come from and i'm not as involved in it as now as i used to be but i mean i know you've had a you've still had a, quite a hand in what that organization has been able to do for women and organizations here in hawaii and maybe you know sharing a little bit more about what they've been doing no, you know no. i go ahead please oh i was just saying yes going on that theme I keep telling Ray St. Chu, who was one of the founders yes. of Hawaii Women Lawyers, that I was a law student and thought it was very intriguing that she was during the summer giving a presentation about getting Hawaii women lawyers together because what a thought, you know, there's not a whole lot of them. And so I saw that starting. I wasn't one of the founders and I wasn't one of the founders of the bar of the Women's Legal Foundation, but I was there early on. And it's been a great group that, you know, for decades we've been working together and we, we see these young women and so many more women lawyers coming on. And all through that, it's been a very service oriented, mm -hmm. um, you know, principled group that's worked very hard and succeeded in advancing women and just being a great support network as well. So that's how we all got to know each other, right? Right. Was I mean, that's how I through those events was going back to those going back to uh, Hawaii Women Lawyers and um, you know the Legal Foundation. I, I guess I haven't been as involved as I you know would like to have been, but it was just even that just kind of seeing that because it was just yeah I don't think we really got the magnitude of how few we were. And, and for black women attorneys, I think there's what three of us at that time. Daphne, oh my. <laughs> Forget who else it was. Uh, no, and I think Wanda, it was just you know, you know, and to see um, that grow to the point where you have um, the action out there. The, 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 the there are more women in law school now. The percentage of women in law school now is higher than for males. I think at UH it is now. Yeah, too. yeah. it's got to change the legal profession. Has to. Has to, yeah, uh, in a good way. <laughs> in a good, because it, it's funny. Like you know, we, we talk about all the issues that we're now having to address. Like she said, I'm do, she said she's doing it for her daughters, and we're all thinking in terms of the contributions that you know women bring to the table. I will never forget one of the first <clears throat> trials that was on the bench during a jury trial, and I won't name him. A male attorney asked, because I haven't gotten permission for him to say this. We were doing our pretrial discussions, you know, settlements and stuff. And one of the things he asked for was, and he's a darn good trial, trial attorney, he's actually gone on to do greater things, asked, could we adjourn at four o'clock every day because he had to pick up the kids? I said, uh, yeah, <laughs> sure, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> So we set out the rules for the trial. It's like four o'clock, we will adjourn every day at four o'clock. And the jurors are like, cool, we beat the traffic, we get out early. But it was because he had to go pick up the kids. And I remember thinking at that moment that when I was coming up as a you know young attorney, not, not so much here, but on the, on the mainland, to even pose that question would have been unthinkable. Don't you agree, Louise? I mean, just- Oh, definitely. The, oh, would you have even said, I've got to go and pick up the kids? <laughs> oh. 
And here we are. Yes, that made sense to me because, yeah, I had to pick up the kids too. No, actually, my husband was picking up the kids at that time because he got <laughs> up early. But yeah, it was the same. <laughs> made sense to me. <laughs> you know, but just those little kinds of considerations and things that having women in the profession and women on the bench and women in politics and women in government bring that sort of balancing that we've not really seen in, in so much in, 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 in American society. Other societies, other countries recognize it, but for some reason we didn't think that was important. And see, I think that's a really, really critically important point that what this newer more diverse leadership is bringing is not just incredible priority, focus, and honor for diversity, equality, and inclusion, or diversity, equity, inclusion, the DEI stuff. But there's a fourth word, the other E word, empowerment. It's not just seats at the table, it's seats at the decision-making table. You're not just an, a junior non-equity partner you're an equity partner in the management group. Hey, you're not just on the list of DPR, AAA, JAMS, arbitrators or mediators. You're getting picked. Hey, you're not just corporate counsel. You're the strategic planning counsel for the company. You're seeing large firms do that. You're seeing companies do it. Really innovative stuff. And those innovations are coming from those diverse leaders. And the study- I think that's, a great, that's yeah. a great point, Chuck, because I think what we can note from 2020 is that um, bad things happened, George Floyd and the other people in the black community who were killed. But out of that, and they, we attribute it to people staying home and watching more TV, it's just a much greater energy and serious attention given to diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, and it's getting to all levels, corporate level. All levels. And I'm, I'm really gratified to see that element happening and to see men, male leaders buying into the idea that diversity and inclusion makes your company stronger and mm -hmm. needs to be part of your corporate culture. And I attribute that, you know, that attention to gender diversity in our firm and in businesses. When I think about male leaders, the ones that are doing it, I really think the way of, have very strong wives and they have daughters. Exactly. <laughs> that really helps create balance. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that is very true. That's a good point. You, you know, I, I think there's an element there that's been not just buried, but actually disrespected and dishonored. And that's exactly what you're talking about, is that those leadership qualities, abilities, strengths, <laughs> that women, uh, Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Indigenous Americans, LGBTQ Americans, disabled Americans, and others have built individually for years and years and years, when you bring those, to collaborative silos, not just individual silos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What they do is immeasurably oh, yeah. oh yeah. So you're exactly right. We have a 78 year old, 40 year politician, white president who has prioritized diversity, equity, inclusion, and empowerment in his administration. Not because he's afraid of getting sued for discrimination if he doesn't do it, but because he knows and believes from an exceptionally strong wife who has worked her way up. Yes. Exactly. exactly. That, that's where the strength really is. Give it a chance. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing. I look forward to, and I look forward to seeing how this diverse team and a collaborative approach is gonna work over the next four years. I really do think it's gonna have a profound effect on the way that things get done and decisions get made. And I hope it can overcome that dysfunction in, con in Congress and that people will be serious about working together and crossing the aisle. I think so. I, I think that's, I, I, I'm very hopeful that that's gonna occur as well, simply because of the, for the reasons that you stated. You've got you know the leaders now who actually have 
have had a history of working and being collaborative with strong women, including in their own families. So that sort of brings a, almost like a natural way of having to deal with things because they've always done it or had to figure, you know, foster that into their decisions and, and what have you. You didn't just operate in this silo. I, I, I am just, I am struck by the contrast and the leadership of this, of the president elect and the past cabinet. And just, I mean, you just look at those rooms, it was frightening to see those, it was just, yes, indeed. it was frightening to see, well, you know what we were looking at. <laughs> yeah, corrupt and destructive. It was frightening, it was frightening. I mean, <laughs> and now you're like, well, wow, this, you know, this, you know, we use that phrase, it looks like America is, but it, that's not a trite phrase, that has meaning. That has to, that is important, that we, we can't have all these decisions being made, and I, I was especially the ones about women, it was, it was that one visual that had um, a room full of white males making decisions about what should be done with women. For women, like what? Are you serious? Is... <laughs> anyway, I digress, but nonetheless. <laughs> not really. I, I think it's right on point. Yeah, because... not a digression at all. Um, I, <laughs> I was going to say something too that I think no matter what happens in Georgia, of course, I'm hoping for a certain outcome in Georgia, but that that uh, community and that state is changing. It sounds like there's much more empowered groups, um, diverse groups. That are happening and if it doesn't change this time it seems like change is on the way it's changed forever georgia is changed forever i think so i mean just the notion of you know oh go ahead chuck i'm sorry no no that's that's a really good thing i was just thumbs up for that <laughs> yeah yeah i mean just a, just the notion of i mean you look at the number of of of, of sheer volume of registered voters who are coming up stepping up realizing i should vote i mean i was i i, I did some Kind of work after the 2016. I was a, kind of surprised at the number of people that I encountered in my own circles and in my own, you know, knowledge areas of people who did not vote. There were a lot of them. And that has changed. Vote. And this time, that didn't happen. Those folks got out there. There's some new ones, especially these younger folks. I mean, they got out there in, you know, in droves. And uh, I was listening to one of my daughter has me listening to these podcasts of all these characters, I guess I would say. <laughs> and that's just some, it's called Evelyn from the Internet. She's, she just has a podcast and she just talks. But one of the things that she talked about, my daughter had me to listen to her today. She was talking about the election and she's, uh, you know, she's a millennial. And she was talking about how that when she was growing up, she was eight years old when George Bush was elected and she did the two terms and she kind of watched that and she watched that, you know, growing up, this was the view she had. And then there was Obama, she was old enough to vote. And she voted, she calls herself the Obama kids. That was the world they grew up in. That was the world they saw as young adults being in his presidency, which impacted how they see and it. I guess there's a lot of those. <laughs> She's Evelyn from, she calls herself Evelyn from the internet. And she just it's, espouses on all kinds of things. But that was one of them today. And I thought, well, that's interesting. She says, we're the Obama kids. And we're out of time, but what a great place. Yeah. To bring it full circle. What we can take from 2020 into 2021 is exactly that, our choice. Stand up for it, make it, defend it, and make it ours for all of us. People, thank you. See you in 2021. And thank, thank you so you. much, Sandra. Safe and safe and sane remaining holiday season. We're gonna get through this. Yes. Happy holidays, happy new year to everybody. Yes. Thank See you all. You. Okay.